It doesn't matter how you do it, every one of us is always using DampDB in SQL Server. We can use DampDB directly when we are working with table variables, damp tables in SQL Server, and you will also use it indirectly because SQL Server internally uses DampDB. For example, when you have sort hash operations, those operations can spill over to DampDB. And DampDB by default is just misconfigured. There's no excuse. When you have installed SQL Server, SQL Server just gives you by default a misconfigured DampDB and that misconfiguration can lead to various performance problems in DampDB and one specific problem is called latch contention. Who of you has already heard about latch contention? Few of you? Perfect. Let's have a look on that. In SQL Server we have the buffer pool. The buffer pool is the main memory cache where we just store the pages that we are reading from our slow storage subsystem. It means SQL Server caches those pages of 8 kilobytes in the buffer pool so that we can request and return them very, very fast. When we read and write to pages in the buffer pool, SQL Server also has to synchronize that access when we want to try and read from that page or from a specific page simultaneously across multiple threads. And for that thread synchronization, SQL Server uses internally so-called latches and those latches can lead to performance problems. Every time when we read a page, SQL Server acquires a shared latch. Every time when we change a page, SQL Server acquires an exclusive latch and both latches are again just incompatible to each other. Means when you read a page from the buffer pool, you can't concurrently change that page when you change a page, you can't concurrently read from that page. In that case, a reader blocks a writer, a writer blocks a reader. And that blocking situation happens in main memory. Normally we say main memory is very, very fast. We have latency times of nanoseconds. How many nanoseconds has a second? One billion means nanosecond is very, very short. Access to main memory is very, very fast. When you have latch contention, access to those pages in main memory is very, very slow because again, you have to wait. The problem is now, in DampDB, because in DampDB we create a huge amount of different temporary objects like damp tables, table variables, and when we create such an object in DampDB, SQL Server has to find some free space in our data file. Means we have our data file, by default we have just one, and within that data file SQL Server uses specialized system pages to just keep track where is some free space within the data file. SQL Server uses here various pages, a so-called BFS page, page free space page, a GAM page, global allocation map page, and a so-called SGAM page, shared global allocation map page. Those are just three different system pages, which are again 8 kilobytes large. And with those system pages, SQL Server is able to find free space in our data file. Of course, when we read from that page, we have to latch that page. When we finally change that page, because we have allocated some free space in our data file, we have to exclusively latch that page. 
means when you have multiple worker threads, multiple queries in SQL Server, they are just competing against those pages. Means when you have only one data file, you have also only one set of those specialized system pages. Means there's only one page that you can read from the buffer pool, there's only one page that you have to change. It's just a competition within SQL Server. Very simple to reproduce. Let's have a look on that one. <coughs> I'm running here a default stupid configuration of DampDB. Just one data file. The only thing that I have changed is the initial size. Normally, SQL Server gives you a initial size of 8 megabytes. Who on earth has already seen a DampDB in a production environment with 8 megabytes? Nobody. So that's the first thing that you should always change, the initial size. Because as the name implies, DampDB is just a temporary database. When we restart SQL Server, SQL Server creates a copy of the model database and recreates our DampDB. Means when you use the initial size of 8 megabytes and you restart SQL Server, your DampDB has again 8 megabytes and afterwards you perform expensive autogroup operations, which again costs you some performance. So when you know that you need some space in DampDB, just set it so that SQL Server afterwards already initializes DampDB during the startup. Let's create in the first step a new database. Within that database, I again create a very simple start procedure. I create a temp table. I create a unique clustered index on that damp table. In a while loop, I just insert 10 rows. Nothing special. I create another stored procedure, which just calls the first created stored procedure 100 times. Nothing special. We execute that one. Perfect, it works. Let's deploy it to production. But in production, one thing is different. There are multiple users, hopefully. It means in a production environment, that stored procedure will perform in a completely different way. Let's simulate that. I use again ostress.exe. I execute that stored procedure with 100 parallel users means 100 parallel users are trying to create a temp table in DampDB. Means all those users, all those sessions have to read those pages and finally when they have allocated some free space in our data file in DampDB, they have also changed those pages, means they have to acquire an exclusive log. We have only one page in that buffer pool because we have only one data file. Means one query is changing that page. It has exclusively latched that page. All the other 99 ones are just waiting for writing and for reading. Means you have no throughput anymore. Let's copy that comment line over to the comment prompt. Let's start that and let's go to activity monitor. It's really nice to see waiting tasks almost 100. You have no throughput. Almost every query is waiting on one of those specialized system pages. You can also see that very, very nicely in system OS waiting tasks. 
I'm restricting here on database ID 2, file ID 1, the one and only in DampTP, and the ID of those internal pages. As you can see, we have 92 waiting desks, and they are waiting on a page latch update. means we want to change that page in the buffer pool of SQL Server. And as you can see, we have the wait duration in milliseconds. We have a duration of two milliseconds. Previously, we have said access to main memory is very, very fast. We are talking about nanoseconds. Now we are talking about milliseconds. That's a huge difference. And you can see the resource description, the resource we are waiting on, is always the same. You're waiting on the same page, the one and only that currently exists in the buffer pool for DampDB. This workload took 31 seconds. It's slow, as we will see later. But you are faster as the guys in Gothenburg and in Malmö. It took 32 seconds. So you have a positive influence on MySQL Server. How can we fix that problem? Restart will not work. Create more files. Why? More files are just overhead. We can run the allocation in parallel. I will show you that in a few seconds. When we look on our wait stats, you can also see we have here so-called page latch wait types means we have waited on accessing pages in main memory. When you see the name page latch without IO in its name, it just means you are waiting in main memory. When you see a page IO latch, it means you are waiting on your storage subsystem. Here we are waiting on accessing pages in main memory. Let's copy those things out so that we can later convert those wait types. As you can see, for example, page latch shared, we wanted to read a page in main memory, we have waited for 641,000 times. Just think about that. A huge amount of waits have occurred in main memory, which is normally very, very fast. So the first thing that we can do is we give them to be multiple files. In that case, when we give them to be multiple files, SQL Server implements a so-called round-robin allocation. This isn't specific to DampDB, this also applies to your normal application databases. Imagine we have two data files. A first one, a second one. In that case, SQL Server makes a round-robin allocation and SQL Server allocates the first 64 kilobytes, a so-called extent, in the first file, the second extent in the second file, the third extent in the first file, the fourth extent in the second file, the fifth extent in the first one, the sixth one in the second one, and so on and so on. Means you, do a you are doing a round robin allocation between those individual files and you can concurrently access and latch those pages in the buffer pool because you have just multiple copies for every data file. Means that will solve in some way that specific problem. The only thing that you must make sure is that those data files must have the same size. Imagine we have one file with 50 gigabytes and one file, let's say, with 100 gigabytes. Besides the round robin allocation, SQL Server also makes sure that both files are full at the same point in time. How can you make sure that both files are full at the same point in time? We write more to the larger one. 
means we, wa we make one allocation in the smaller one, we make two allocations in the larger one, one allocation in the smaller one, two allocations in the larger one, and over time they will be full at the same point in time. That's very, very important. When you have multiple data files, they must have the same size and also the same autogroup factors. So that they are also growing with the same size over time. There's also a trace flag in SQL Server 1117. When you enable that trace flag, SQL Server grows all your files together. Means when SQL Server starts autogroup operation on one file, it also kicks in on the other files simultaneously. How many data files do we need for TempDB? It depends on what? On the cores, on the number of cores. The recommendation is very simple. When you have up to eight cores, You just make a one-to-one -one mapping to the data files. So with eight cores, you give them to be eight data files. If you have more than eight cores, you give them to be around one half to one fourth of data files. How much? You have to benchmark it for your specific workload. Okay. One data file in general is just too less. In my case, I have now four cores and I'm not following the recommendation. I'm just lazy. I'm just giving them to be one additional file to just show you what it means to just have two temp DB data files. The first step, I clear my weight stats so that we can afterwards see how the weight stats will be differently just with two additional, just with one additional file. In the first step, as I've said, please give the original data file a reasonable size. Eight megabytes is too less. Nine megabytes is too less. In my case, as you have already said, I have preset the first file to 512 megabytes. And now I'm just adding one additional data file with the same size. Means when we look now to DempDB, I have two data files with the same initial size. And as I've said, you should also look on your autogroup factors. They should be also the same. So this here is also a stupid idea means the adding of the new file is just an online operation. means you can do it during your business hours. Are we now already able to rerun our workload? Yes or no? Why? We can rerun our workload but we have a problem. Which problem? We have two data files with 512 megabyte of size. How much free space we have in the second file? Everything, 512. How much free space we have in the first file? less than everything. <coughs> Means we have already done here some allocations. Means in the first file we have less free space as in the second one, the newly added one. Means SQL Server will make more allocations in the second in the new file as in the first one in the old one. Means that round robin allocation doesn't really work very well. How can you fix that problem? We can restart SQL Server. 
What's the harder way? We just add more data files. Means when you add more data files, the round robin allocation will just distribute over those files. Just think about that one. So when you have a DampDB in an ongoing scenario with a workload and you just add one data file, you're just moving that latch contention from the first file to the second file. Doesn't help you too much. In my case, I'm now restarting SQL Server. Don't tweet about that one. I just want to show you that those changes are preserved. People are always telling me, or some people are sometimes telling me, we are not restarting SQL Server because, or we are not restarting, sorry. We are not making changes to DempDB because when we restart SQL Server, those changes are lost. Ha, ha, ha. As I've said previously, it's a temporary database, yeah. SQL Server just recreates DempDB from the model database, but afterwards our user-defined changes that we have done are applied. Means in that case, as you can see, after the restart, we have now two data files with the initial size of 512 megabytes. So those changes that you are making here they are preserved when you're restarting SQL Server. That's very, very important. Perfect. Let's run our workload again. 31 seconds. What do you mean? What do you think? How fast SQL Server will be now? Then. No. 15. No. No, not really. Maybe SQL Server is slower. No, just kidding. <laughs> Around 20 to 23 seconds. 21. Imagine that. Initially, that workload took 31 seconds. And now that workload just takes 21 seconds. We have gained 10 seconds by just adding one additional data file to DempDB. Just think about that. Just one data file and that workload is 30% faster. Just think about that. DempDB is a performance bottleneck by design. Misconfigured by default. Bad for you, great for me as a consultant. I like your problems. The default is changing in SQL Server 2016. In SQL Server 2016, we can now finally specify how many data files. Up to the number of cores that we have. But how much data files? You have to define it. You have to set it. I think by default it's again just one file. No, I think it's number of cores. Up to 18. Okay. Yeah. So in SQL Server 2016, they are finally making DempDB a little bit better. Bad for me. <coughs> well, of course, it takes ages since until anyone is using SQL Server 2016, so doesn't matter. Takes years. So that's the first thing that you have to change when you have installed SQL Server. You give DempDB more than one data file. Okay? The second thing that you can make sure for DempDB is that SQL Server caches your temporary objects in DempDB. In some specific cases, SQL Server is able to cache a temp table, a table variable that you have created in DempDB. The problem is that caching has a huge amount of limitations. For example, when you use on that temporary object like a temp table, DTL statements, like a create index statement, a create statistics statement, SQL Server can't cache that temp table internally. 
When you think back, when we have created initially that stored procedure, we have created that temp table, and afterwards I have created the unique clustered index. Means, in that case, SQL Server is now not able to cache our temp table. When we go up to the, the, to the definition of that stored procedure, you can see create unique clustered index statement. Because of that DDL statement, SQL Server can't cache that temp table. Means every time when we issue that create table statement, SQL Server has to physically allocate some pages. SQL Server is not able to reuse cached pages. Every time when you drop a temp table, when the temp table is out of scope, SQL Server just marks those pages for deallocation. Means when another session kicks in and requests the same physical temp table, SQL Server can just reuse those cached pages instead of going to the data file and find with those specialized system pages some free space to make new allocations. Very easy to prove that that temp table can't be cached. We have in SQL Server a performance counter called temp tables creation weight. You can grab all the SQL Server relevant performance counters from system OS performance counters. Means when you are on development, the one and only person, you grab that performance counter, you execute your stored procedure, you grab that performance counter again, and you just compare both means when we run that and when we afterwards go down in the messages window to our print statement we will see amazing things. We have created 1000 temp tables. As you can see we were running a while loop, then iterations, we have called that stored procedure. Within that stored procedure we have executed 100 iterations where we have created that temp table means every temp table was physically allocated with those specialized system pages means SQL Server had to read and change those system pages and SQL Server also had to latch those pages in the buffer pool when we read and write from those pages. So the question is now when we go up to our stored procedure again how can we get rid of that unique, create unique clustered index statement? By preserving the clustered index, otherwise it's easy. Sorry? Yeah, how can you enforce a unique clustered index in SQL Server? Without specifying it? <coughs> Primary key constraint. Give me a few more seconds. You are already in the future. You are already in the future. So what I'm doing now, I'm altering my stored procedure and I'm just specifying the primary key constraint. The primary key constraint by default also gives us a unique clustered index. And since SQL Server 2014, we are able to create inline non-clustered indexes. So you can define here your non-clustered indexes inline. That's a syntax needed for in-memory OLTP and as a side effect it also improves the caching mechanism of temp tables. Who of you has already heard about in-memory OLTP? Who likes it? Who uses it? Nobody. <laughs> I have written a few weeks ago or months ago, time goes by, a blog posting why I don't yet recommend in memory OLTP for my customers. Let's reload that blog posting and just listen. The problem is, everyone is so excited about in-memory OLTP, but it's just a crappy technology that we can't use currently. Currently, SQL Server 2014. SQL Server 2016 will be better. 
as someone has said previously outside, we have fewer restrictions, but we still have restrictions. So I've just written here some things like, we have no foreign keys. Who on earth needs a referential integrity? Nobody. We have very good written applications. Nobody needs referential integrity. Even the query optimizer can produce you better execution plans with a referential integrity. Forget about that one. No schema changes. Hey, cool, in SQL Server 2014, when you want to change your memory optimized table, for example, you want to add a column, you want to change your indexing strategy, you have to drop and recreate your table. Side effect, when you're dropping your table, you're losing your data. No execution plans, that's great. When you natively compile a stored procedure, you have no actual execution plan anymore. The query optimizer gives you an estimated one, but who cares about the estimated execution plan? The actual can be different. There is no actual execution plan anymore because Microsoft compiles everything down to C code. Means your execution plan, your actual one is just C code. Very cool for troubleshooting. So a huge amount of different limitations, no recompilations. Imagine your statistics are changing, your data distribution changes, you are not getting a new execution plan. If you want to get a new execution plan, you drop and recreate your stored procedure. Great. Not really recommended. Just a side effect. But everything is fixed and you should stop to fix it. No. No. There is a blog posting from Aaron Bertrand on sqlperformance.com a few weeks ago in memory OLTP enhancements. And as you can see, they have done some improvements. I've not yet looked on that one. For example, table size, two terabytes instead of 256 gigabytes. What else we have? Alter table, partially supported. Don't ask me what it means in reality. For rain keys, supported. Parallel plan, supported. Some more obscure joins are supported. So it gets better and better over the time, but it's a very, very, very niche technology in SQL Server. Nobody on earth will almost nobody on earth will ever use in-memory OLTP. It's for very, very, sp one second, one minute, one hour, no. It's for very, very specialized things in SQL Server. We have different problems, which you can solve just with an indexing strategy. But in-memory OLTP is a very, very specialized technology. It's the same, imagine, uh, you have a traffic jam in Stockholm. You are very, very slow. And to solve that performance problem, you are buying a Ferrari. Doesn't solve anything. You can drive faster, but you can't use that power. It's the same here. Question? Of course, only in the expensive edition of SQL Server. Okay. Expensive is enterprise edition, yeah. Of course, uh, Microsoft also needs some money so that we are afterwards excited. OK. Can I have a, a question about the temp DB? Um, when we talked about in-memory, there are also solid state memories, which, which are quite fast. Uh, if you put your temp DB on a solid state drive, then yeah. uh, does that to have several of them to, to allocate? This specific problem can't be solved uh, with solid state drives because it happens in main memory. It's just a synchronization mechanism that SQL Server has to employ in main memory. Yeah. We are not talking here about physical I.O. Oh, okay. It's just contention in main memory. So let's change that stored procedure. Is there any difference between logic uh, cores and uh, virtual cores? Uh, no. no. 
because for every core, logically or physical core, you are getting one scheduler in SQL Server. So SQL Server internally makes no difference. So I'm changing now that stored procedure means we get rid of that create unique clustered index statement with the use of the primary key constraint. And now SQL Server is able to cache and reuse that temporary table. Means when we run that test again with the performance counter temp tables creation rate, you will see now when we go down again, we have created only once a temp table and we have reused it 999 times means we have only touched once those specialized system pages in the buffer pool of SQL Server. Make sense? Let's clear again our wait stats and let's rerun our workload. What do you think? How fast? We had around 21 seconds. 18. Sorry? 18. 18. No. 12.5, you are slow. <laughs> Normally it completes within 10 to 11 seconds. But still, we had previously an execution time of 21 seconds. Now SQL Server was able to cache that temp table and we have improved it again by nine seconds. And when you think back, initially we have started with 31 seconds. We have almost gained 20 seconds for that specific workload. Just think about that. It's now time to applause. Really, you have to clap your hands. Yeah. So it's really, really amazing to see what you can do in DempDB. You have to make sure that SQL Server has multiple DempDB files so that we can latch multiple specialized system pages in the buffer pool. And you also have to make sure that SQL Server can cache those temp tables to get the best possible performance out of DempDB. And when we look now on our weight stats, they are quite different from previously. Let's move that up. And let's compare them to previously. Previously, when we have looked on page latch shared, where we wanted to read 640,000 times, we have waited. Now we have waited only around 200,000 times. When you look on page latch update, where you want to update a specific page, waiting times 220. 282,000 times in the initial configuration. Now we have only 132,000 times. So that's a huge difference, a huge improvement from our wait stats. We are just waiting the less within SQL Server means as a side effect, we have more, more throughput and the performance is just better. So as I've said, DampDB is just a performance bottleneck by design and you have only one DempDB for your complete SQL Server instance. Means when you have a huge amount of user databases on your SQL Server instance, they're always competing against one DempDB. It's the same when we are here and we have only one public toilet outside. We will have fun. One person is the lucky one, the other ones are just waiting. This happens all the time in DempDB. Questions on that? You have to make sure that you're not using those limitations that I have mentioned previously. So what version of this occurred? No idea, at least since SQL Server 2005. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. <coughs> Last part, latch, uh, latch contention, spin lock contention. Who of you has already heard something about spin locks? What is a spin lock? It's a atomic supply trade. Uh, a spin lock. In terms of the scale or? Yeah. Okay. 
A spin lock is a very, very lightweight synchronization object employed by the storage engine of SQL Server to protect in-memory data structures. Let's go back in time. As I've said, when we have talked about thread pool starvation, every query in SQL Server goes through that query lifecycle of running, suspended, runnable, running, suspended, runnable, and so on. Over and over and over and over again. We have now a few hundred data structures in SQL Server, 262 in the RTM version of SQL Server 2014, where the developers of SQL Server are expecting a very, very short wait. For example, when you access the hash table of the lock manager, you are expecting a very, very short wait. Maybe you are able to access that hash table of the lock manager within a few nanoseconds. Very, very fast. In that case, it doesn't make sense to put that query into the suspended state you wait in the suspended state, then you move to the runnable state, you wait in the runnable state until the CPU becomes available, and afterwards you move that query from the runnable state into the running state. It would be just too much overhead. It's the same. When we go to the toilet and the toilet is locked, you're not going home and wait. You're just waiting actively in front of that door. And the same thing happens in SQL Server. When the developers of SQL Server expecting a very, very short wait, the query stays in the running state. And the query just waits in the running state. How can you wait in the running state? You are just spinning in a while loop. You are just burning down CPU cycles. You're just spinning in a while loop and you're spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning until that protected resource becomes available. It's a so-called busy wait. We are waiting actively in a busy while loop on our CPU. Means that thread will not yield, will not go off the CPU. We're just spending some CPU cycles in the running state and we're just spinning in a while loop because going to the suspended state, to the runnable state, would be just too expensive. It's much cheaper to just spin in that while loop until we can acquire that shared resource. The problem is now, imagine the developers of SQL Server have thought, we can acquire that resource very, very fast, but in reality, it takes a huge amount of time. Imagine we are waiting on the toilet door and the person inside just sleeps. In that case, we have a huge problem because we are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and all the other persons are also waiting and waiting and waiting. And waiting in the context of SQL Server means we are spinning in a while loop actively on our CPUs, means your CPUs are going up to 100%. And SQL Server doesn't perform any useful work anymore. In that case, when you look to your weight stats, you will see the weight type SOS scheduler yield. And when you go to system OS spin lock stats, you can identify in which specific spin lock you have that problem. And finally, you can create an extended event session. And with extended events, you are able to get back the call stack where that spin lock contention problem occurred. But that's not the DSQL call stack, that's the C++ call stack means for us it's normally useless because we have no idea how SQL Server is implemented internally. I want to give you one specific example and we will also see that example later. The first thing is it's a bug in SQL Server. 
in the RTM version of Sigma Server 2014 means when you have updated, uh, when you have installed a CU, when you have installed a service pack which might work, you will not be able to reproduce it. You need this. You need the RTM version of SQL Server 2014. It's a spin lock convention problem in the lock hash spin lock. Means it has to do with the lock manager of SQL Server. We have already looked into the lock manager, system 2 n locks. Internally, the lock manager uses a hash table. And within that hash table, we have multiple hash buckets. And SQL Server distributes the individual locks into those various hash buckets. Every time when you use a database, so when you say use AdventureWorks, then you get a shared lock on that database. Means that shared lock prevents a drop of that database. That shared lock prevents that someone else restores a database. That shared lock is placed into a specific hash bucket based on the database ID. Means when you have 10 connections to AdventureWorks, those 10 shared locks are placed into the same hash bucket. And as you can see, those locks are just linked together, a double linked list. The first lock points to the second lock, the second lock points to the first lock. And every time when you want to access that chain of locks, you have to acquire a spin lock. Means that chain is protected by a spin lock. You have to acquire that spin lock so that you can look on that data structure. Imagine now what happens when we have, for example, 10,000 locks for a specific database. 10,000 shared locks. You're just opening connections and you're not closing them. In that case, that linked list gets very, very long. Imagine now what happens when you want to open a new connection to a database. In that case, you have to acquire the shared lock. So you acquire that spin lock. You are the first one, the lucky one. You acquire that spin lock and then you have to go through that linked list to find the tail. The longer that linked list is, the longer it takes. And in the meantime, you have protected that linked list with a spin lock. Means everyone else who wants to access that linked list waits in a busy while loop. Means the CPUs are going up to 100% and SQL Server is not performing any useful work anymore. Spin lock contention. Let's have a look on that one. I'm using here a different virtual machine, which is running on Amazon EC2, 32 cores. We just burn down CPU cycles. 32 cores, 244 gigabytes of memory. For us, interesting today are just the cores. Whoa. That's bad. What I'm doing in the first step, I start here a new application. A badly written one. That application, I'm opening 10,000 connections to a specific database, and I'm not closing that connection. Means, we have now in one hash bucket, in the hash table of the lock manager, 10,000 shared locks. So a very, very long list that SQL Server has to traverse when we want to find the tail of that list. We can look into the lock manager, system to unlocks. And as you can see, we have here 10,000 locks for the same database ID. Okay, and what I'm doing in the next step is very, very simple. I'm calling again ostrust.exe. I'm connecting to that specific database, and I'm just calling SP reset connection. SP reset connection has also to go to the lock manager to that specific hash bucket. 
but only one thread at a time can traverse that linked list because it's protected by that spin lock. And all the other ones are just waiting outside in a while loop and driving all our CPU cores to almost 100%. Means we're running that again with 100 parallel users. Let's do that. takes a few seconds. And all our CPU cores are going to around 70% now. That SQL server. 32 cores are spinning in a while loop. And for that implementation, we are paying $7,000 in the Enterprise Edition. We are just burning down CPU cycles. We are just burning down money. Nothing more. Nothing, no useful work happens in SQL Server. Every thread, every query just spins in a while loop. Perfect. For such things, we are paying Microsoft. We start no. Applications. Sorry? Write better, better applications. In that case, our application is just crappy. It's a really, really bad idea to open a connection to a database and never close it. When you do it, it 10,000 times. It's the same when you do a huge amount of recompilations, you can also hit spin lock contention because for recompilation, SQL Server also needs to acquire a spin lock. So even when you are using uh, ad hoc SQL statements, which are not parameters, and SQL Server has always to compile physical execution plans, it can also lead to spin lock contention. So that's just one problem. Means, again, our red phone rings. Business users are complaining SQL Server is not performing any work. No, SQL Server is doing a huge amount of work. Spinning in a while loop. Great. Let's have a look. Let's go to our weight stats. When we have performance problems in the first step, we always go to our weight stats. So let's go to system OS wait stats. As you can see, the VM is a little bit unresponsive. Order by wait time milliseconds descending. And as you can see, as I've said previously, we have here SOS scheduler yield. And you can see when you have a spin lock contention, you have a huge amount of signal wait time. Signal wait time is just the time that we are spending in the runnable state. Means in that case, SQL Server directly puts that query from the running state into the runnable state. Because as soon as you have exceeded a quantum of four milliseconds, SQL Server puts you off the CPU so that another query can use that CPU to perform other useful work. So every query in SQL Server voluntarily yields the CPU. In that case, SQL Server reports an SOS scheduler weight type. And as you can see, the times with SOS scheduler yield, they are just rising. So we can go now to our spin lock stats. SQL Server 2014, we have 262 different internal data structures which are protected by a spin lock, like the hash table of the lock manager. And as you can see, we have here so-called backoffs. What the queries are now doing is the following. They are spinning in a while loop. They are spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And at some point in time, they are just giving up. They are just backing off. Means they are just waiting. 
then we try it again. We are spinning, spinning, and spinning, and spinning, and spinning. Then we are backing off, we are waiting, and we are doing the same thing again. Means in that case, we can do an order by back offs descending. And guess what? We have our lock hash spin lock. And you can see the back offs, they are just rising and rising and rising and rising. Means we have identified now in which specific spin lock we have that specific problem. The next step, we can create an extended event session to further troubleshoot that problem. In the first step, we need to know the internal ID of the lock hash spin lock. We can go to system axi map values and the spin lock has an internal ID of 129. And with that ID, we can create now an X event session. We capture the event spin lock back off, means we want to analyze those back off events. We capture the call stack, the C++ call stack, and we restrict on that specific spin lock. You have to be with an extended event session as restrictive as possible. Otherwise, the extended event session would introduce too much overhead in SQL Server. So your filter predicates must be very, very restrictive. Means in that case, we are only capturing the back of event for the lock hash spin lock. And we write everything in the, into a histogram target. And we just make a group by aggregation on the call stack. Means SQL Server tells us in which C++ call stack we had how many back of events. So let's create that. Extended event session. We still have the problem. You can also symbolize now the call stack. Means when you have installed the public symbols of SQL Server, which I have done, I have them here. There's a blog posting by Paul Randall where Paul describes how you can do that. Then SQL Server is able to symbolize the call stack when you enable those two trace flags. I'm also doing that one. And now I'm starting my extended event session. We wait now a few seconds so that we grab some back of events. And now we can look into that histogram target. We go to management, we go to extended events, we go to our X event session. We have here the histogram target, right click, view target data. And now SQL Server tells us in which C++ call stack we had how many backoffs. Let's refresh that every five seconds and you will see in the first one the backoffs are going up and up and up and up. Means that's our problematic C++ call stack. You can copy that one out. I have already done that. And you have here the C++ call stack. Means SQL Server tells you now very, very precisely why we have that spin lock contention problem. Of course, for us, almost useless information. But even when you look on those method names and class names, in that specific example, it's almost easy to understand what happens in SQL Server. We use a specific database, use statement on the SQL. We open that database, we go to the transaction manager, we want to get the database log, in our case the shared log, which we afterwards request from the log manager. The log manager, the hash table is protected by a spin log, the log hash spin log with the ID 129. That spin log is already granted to someone else and now we just spin in that while loop until we back off exponentially. Then we are going to sleep and finally our X event session kicks in. Easy to understand? No, not really. For us almost useless, but very, very important for Microsoft. So normally when you have spin lock contention, you have 
to go to Microsoft because only Microsoft can help you because only Microsoft knows what happens here in the various method calls. Make sense? <coughs> In that case, as I've said previously, we have just a badly written application. So just opening 10,000 shared logs to a specific database without closing that database doesn't really make sense. Means when I'm closing that application, you can see we are immediately going down and we are finished. Questions on that one? Are you now spin locked? <laughs> Perfect. Because we are finished. <laughs> There's always a summary slide. There's always a summary slide. So what we have what do we have seen over the last two hours and a few minutes? The first step we have talked about the isolation level we'd committed. I have shown you one specific example where SQL Server has used the isolation level read table read internally, even when we were running our transaction in read committed. As we have seen, LOB data types in combination with blocking operators in the execution plan. Then we moved on to thread pool starvation. Most important thing here is when a query waits, the query doesn't release that worker thread means when you have a huge amount of queries, it can lead to that thread pool starvation, means that you have no available worker threads anymore. Easy to troubleshoot as long as you know how you can work with the dedicated admin connection. Then we have moved on to DempDB. Very, very problematic database in SQL Server, as you have seen with the default stupid configuration, just a performance problem by default. And finally, I have shown you a very, very specialized problem in SQL Server. Spin lock contention means all our queries are just spinning in a while loop and SQL Server doesn't perform any useful work anymore. So thanks for attending. Enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of the week, and maybe we will see each other again. Thank you. <laughs>